Hey everyone, this is Jason from Alvatone Audio. Today we're gonna to talk about cables, specifically unbalanced cables. Now everything we've done so far has pretty much been very guitar related, guitar pedal related, pedal boards, that kind of a thing. But I wanna open it up just a little bit because chances are, if you're a musician, you have more than just your performing rig. You may have a small recording studio home, something like that. So not only do you need leads coming out of your instrument, you need to get your effects plugged together, but maybe you need some mic cables, maybe you need some speaker cables, maybe you have a large synthesizer or a drum machine rig and you have tons of outputs and you need to route those things somewhere. You've got cables coming in and out of your sound cards and it goes on and on. So lots of applications for cable out there. Depending on whatever you need your cable for, stick around and I think there'll be some good information here for you to make good decisions. So just like everything in the music store, there's tons of choices when it comes to cable. There's, there's your cheap crappy ones, uh, there's mid-priced ones that will probably be good for most people, there's high-end cables, then you have definitely have a point where you hit a point of diminishing returns where you're paying a lot more money for maybe a little bit more functionality or a little bit better tonal improvement in your cable. And then of course you get into like hi-fi land and audiophile and then everything just descends to madness immediately and you have no idea what anyone's talking about and you're paying you know thousands of dollars for per foot for cable and it's, it's stuff gets insane. So I'm definitely gonna be hitting the sweet spot of middle ground today and just try to keep it down to earth and approachable for everyone. So what I wanna do is there, there's tons of parameters and factors and science around cables and that, and that kind of stuff. But what I wanna do is just take five parameters that is gonna affect everybody for all their applications and let's talk through them and see how you can make a good decision when it comes to getting cable. Those five are gonna be the tone, microphonics, the flexibility, the durability, and the noise rejection. So when we get started, let's just take a look at how a cable is built and how each of these components of the cable are going to impact those, those five areas. So when you have the outer jacket, uh, this is going to impact the flexibility and the durability of your cable. Inside the outer jacket, you're going to have the shield. This comes into play, again, with durability and flexibility, but also noise rejection. And there's a few different types of this. You're gonna have stranded, you're gonna have braided, or sometimes you could have foil, which typically goes with one of the other two types. Next, you're going to have a dielectric. And again, this is non-conductive. This basically keeps current going between the conductor and the shield. This comes into play with flexibility and durability as well, and also possibly microphonics. Next, you have the conductor, which is in the center. This comes into play with the flexibility and durability as well. Now, these all cables are gonna have these four components. You may have extra ones, which means you could have, as a fifth component, between the dielectric and the shield, you could have what they typically call just a second conductor, or excuse me, a second shield, which is not a dielectric, but actually conductive, which helps with noise rejection. Not all cables will have it, but it's certainly a good feature to have. Another feature you could have, like I said, is a foil braid that goes on the outside of the shield. And again, that helps with noise reduction as well in certain circumstances. So definitely gonna have those four as well, and I'm gonna try to keep my terminology straight as we go through this. Let's get started with tone. Now, when you think about your tone, cables probably aren't the first thing you think of. However, when people talk about like uh, really good preamps or amplifiers, you know, like studio engineers, uh, studio gear, that kind of a thing, there's, there's a saying that, that's wire with gain, meaning I want a really clean preamp. I just want wire with gain, meaning I want this device to make my signal louder and nothing else. I don't want it to impart any kind of tone on my signal. And this goes for all things like compressors, EQs, whatever. They don't want any coloration, they just want the function applied to the signal. Guitar players specifically, who I've been talking to a lot, they're, they're always thinking about tone, like every single factor, even to like a really minute degree, like you know individual components and pedals and amplifiers and tubes, and there's tons and tons of stuff out there. But even in guitar land, I think lots of players don't really look at their cables as being a tonal element. Even though there are manufacturers out there that say, well, this cable is voiced a certain way. This is voiced you know, for the brightest tone you can, or this is voiced for the bass players with the, the best, tightest, low-end frequency response possible out of a cable. 
And honestly, there is some truth to some of this. Whether or not you want to pay for it is entirely up to you. Uh, I'm not making a recommendation here. By all means, if you can hear a difference and you want to pay for a difference, then you can have it. Uh, for sure, those products are out there. But all voicing and tone quality aside, there is one component of cable that does consistently affect your tone, and that is the capacitance of the cable and capacitance is always going to affect high-end roll-off or the relative brightness or dullness of your cable. So when I say capacitance, think capacitors, like you would just have in a standard audio circuit. If you look at what a capacitor is, it's basically two pieces of a conductive material and they're separated by a dielectric, which does not conduct. Cable is the same way. If you look at the shield and the center conductor as two pieces of conductive material, they are separated by the dielectric, which you looked at. So there is a very physical similarity between the cable and the capacitor. Now, how it's measured is in picofarads and it's typically measured by foot. And most cable manufacturers will tell you what that is and they'll say it's, it's basically X amount of picofarads per foot. And you'll usually see numbers between maybe like the high 30s and the low 40s is a good range that you're looking for. And as a general rule, lower is always better. And low capacitance cables typically cost us a little bit more than a high capacitance cable, but in general, I find that it's worth it. Next is microphonics. And there's a technical term for this, and that's triboelectric. And if you haven't heard before, this is something that you can, um, you can reproduce pretty easily in your cables. And all you would do is you would take your instrument cable, plug it into your amplifier, don't plug the other end and into an instrument, and you can either just shake it or wiggle it or take something like a screwdriver and actually just tap on the cable. And you should hear noises coming out through your amplifier to some degree, either quite loudly or quite softly, uh, hopefully on the softly side. Now, this is what I say when I'm talking about microphonics, and it's a phenomenon that exists in all cables to some degree. And the reason it happens is the same reason that you would get shocked if you slide your feet, you went uh, uh, across the carpet and you touch a doorknob. It's basically, even at a very small level, like a molecular level, you have dissimilar materials that are coming into contact with one another and they're building up static charge. Now, one of the things you can minimize as a cable manufacturer is we talked a little bit about the second shield earlier. And I've got it peeled back a little bit on this one. So as you can see here, we have our dielectric, which is white, and it's wrapped in this small layer of a conductive material, not another dielectric. Okay. And this is when you, when you look at specifications, this is where you're going to start to see terms like PVC or a conductive PVC or carbon or even a carbon impregnated PVC. And all this does is this is going to try to assist those static charges that build up and in coming into contact with the shield and then draining off from there as opposed to getting into your signal. So if you look at lead cables, like something that's going to go right out of your guitar, uh, down into your pedal board or your amplifier, and it gets moved around a lot as you move around, this is a really good feature to have because they really do work as far as minimizing those microphonic noises that are going to come through your signal. However, it is incredibly important because this is conductive, when you build your cables, you have to strip this off and you have to make sure if you buy a cable, you have to know that it's on there because if you leave this on, and again, imagine if you were to take that center conductor, push it all the way through the hole in the center tab of your quarter inch jack, uh, it is very possible that this material would come into contact with the solder tab and therefore you just created a short in your cable. Now it could be subtle and I, I've had it before where I've seen them where they just have immense high end roll off because it's not a, a very good connection or you could have it where there's enough contact where it's completely killing your signal, it's a short. So if you're gonna use cable that has these uh, conductors on it, make sure that you strip them off all the way back um, to the end of the outer jacket if you can. Next is flexibility. Flexibility is typically a feature that you're really gonna want or even need in an instrument cable, like something that's coming directly out of your instrument going down to your pedal board, your amplifier, and it's something that's gonna move around a lot with you. And one of the reasons flexibility is really nice is because flexible cables tend to lie flat when you just throw them down on the ground. Uh, cables that don't lie flat get tripped on and they tend to get stomped on and crimped a lot more. So 
uh, a cable with good flexibility as a result can kind of end up being a little bit more durable because it stays out of your way a little bit, particularly during a performance. And, and again, it's when you look at some popular brands like Mogami, people talk a lot about how those cables feel. And especially if you're just doing like, say like eight channel snakes of quarter inch cables or that kind of thing. It's like when you have these, you know, small studio snakes that you're always handling a lot, I mean, they just feel really nice in your hand. They just have, give you like a good confidence. But it's definitely not something that you need for every scenario. Like for example, on your pedal board, all those small jumper cables that you're going to use to connect your cables. You don't necessarily need a good feel or a lot of flexibility in that situation. You just, you want to make sure that you're not, you know, really putting sharp, sharp bends in these. Um, which is a little bit harder to do on a non-flexible cable because then your outer shield can start to separate a little bit and that can start to get noise inside of your cable. But as long as you're not like cramping these things like really, really tightly, I think you're going to be fine. So, and again, for all those other applications, like, you know, back in your studio, like coming out of the back of your patch bay or, you know, cables that are coming on your sound cart, flexibility is not something that you're just really going to need. A little stiffness is fine. And especially if you're doing installations, a little stiffness can really help those cables uh, stay where you put them. If you're really into appearance, you really want things looking neat, which there's a lot of good technical reasons why you want to do to make sure your audio cables are run separately from your power cables or route these things away from transformers or anything that gives off electromagnetic interference. You know, a little stiffness can go a long way to making sure that your cables are going to stay where you put them. Next is durability. And durability is another consideration that's really relative from application to application. And the main thing you're going to see this, as we said, is in the outer jackets. If you look at these two cables in particular, these are the, the two thickest cables I have out here on the table. They use a lot of material in that outer jacket to help protect uh, the conductors on the inside from getting smashed or broken, that kind of a thing. Now, just like we talked about before, this is a little bit more important in, again, like an instrument cable that's maybe on, it gets stepped on on stage. You're constantly coiling it and uncoiling it, put it into a bag or a box or something like that. You don't necessarily need all that additional thickness and all that additional mass on your cable, again, like back in the studio. So that's why instrument cables tend to be very, very thick and cables that are a little bit more optimized for, say, pedal board usage, like these ones, tend to be quite a bit thinner just because you don't need all that mass. And it comes to a certain point, depending on, again, on the application, where it's just a lot of material and it takes up a lot of space. And if you're ever trying to run cables through, you know, the back of racks, that kind of thing, you don't want to be taking up any more space than necessary. It just, it's just all that extra material just ends up going to waste. Now, the, the other factor here on durability is I think you have to be real with yourself about how hard you are on your gear. You know, maybe you baby your cables, you take really good care of them, you know how to coil them properly, which means you're actually using an over-under method as opposed to just like cranking them around your elbow, like I see a lot of people do, or just like, you know, using the end of the cable to tie a granny knot onto itself. I mean, these kind of things are just very hard on the cable and they are going to cause that shield and possibly the center conductor to have a shorter lifespan. If you take care of your cables, if you don't stomp on them, they're going to last longer. So just, just be real with yourself, find out how hard you are on your gear and then use that as a judgment to determine, you know, how durable you really need a cable to be. And lastly, we have noise rejection. And noise rejection is the ability of the cable to keep outside interference out of the signal. And that is almost exclusively a function of the shield, which you see here on the outside. Now, like I said, there's, this comes in three categories. Two mo being most common for unbalanced cable, which is you're either going to have a braid like this, or you're just going to have a spiral, which I've already wrapped up here, which is just small amounts of cable, this incredibly small cables, and they're just wrapped around the dielectric and you basically just peel that off and you twist it up and you're done. Now if you're looking for ease of use, spiral is definitely a little bit easier to use because the braid what you have to do is you have to peel these back which during assembly it's going to take extra time. I'm not saying it's a deal breaker but it's one of those things if you're looking if you're actually soldering your own cables and you're, you're looking for the easiest way to go then you may want to check out a cable with a spiral braid which are, are fine you know e either one is, is going to work for you. If you are using the braided cables, like I said, you have to uh, actually unpeel the braid a little bit. To do that, uh, a little trick for you, if you take the braid and you actually just push it back a little bit, like this, it will open up the braid a little bit and you find it will unravel just a little bit easier. And you just take any sharp object, uh, this is just an awl, uh, but, and you, you can use anything, you can use a nail, is fine. And you just want to be careful 
and you just want to take like one straight row like here all the way back and just slowly start to open it up and again depending on how quick you are and how careful you are I mean you want to be kind of careful when you do this because you don't want to be breaking any more cables off than, than absolutely necessary so you just want to keep it intact and you just go all the way back and making sure you're opening it up the whole way and just go all the way back until you hit uh, the back of the strip. There is a third type that you can get and it, it's actually a foil. They're not totally common in instrument cable and it, if you ever search for like installation cable or console cable you'll see them start to come up. Now the one benefit to a foil shield cable is they have the absolute best radio frequency or RF rejection that you can get. So if you tend to do a lot of stage shows, you know, Broadway kind of stuff where there's tons and tons of wireless, if you've ever done gigs on military bases or, or, you know, big festivals where there's just tons of like communication going on background, foil shielded cable goes a long way to rejecting that particular type of noise. It's not something that everyone needs, but if you are one of those players that gigs regularly in one of those high RF environments and you consistently have noise problems with your rig, you may want to look into getting getting some foil shielded cable and that could clear up some noise problems for you. With all the basics out of the way, let's just take a look at a bunch of different cables and I'll make a couple recommendations on, on cables that I like but this is just to kind of help you know like what's out there a little bit if you want to do some of your own research or do some shopping. This is some stuff that's worked well for me and maybe a couple brands that you hadn't really considered. Okay, the first one up is Lava Cable and they make a ton of stuff and they sell of course pre-built pre cables but they also do bulk cable which you can buy by the foot. And the main variations they have are, this is Blue Demon, which is meant for like an instrument cable. They have ELC, or Extreme Low Capacitance, again, an instrument cable, really thick outer jacket on this. They have Magma, which is their entry level, kind of like budget cable. And these are definitely uh, oriented more for an instrument cable, something that's going to be a little bit more on the durable side. Then the diameter drops and they start to go really small. And this is the mini ELC, or the mini extreme low capacitance, which I like a lot. And this is actually what I have on my pedal board right now, and I have no problems with it. It's, um, it's got a good feel, it's flexible enough, it's got a really solid braided shield on it. It does have a second shield on there. Uh, it, it's pretty easy to work with. I like it a lot. From there, they go to the um, mini ultra mafic, ultra mythic, mafic, whatever, I'm not sure how you see it. This is the only silver coated cable out of the bunch, which is why it's a different color. And then it goes to their solid core cables, which they use for their own solderless cable and jack system. So, and the interesting stuff about this is we talk about flexibility. Because these have solid cores, if you bend this cable, it stays. Maybe that's something we want, maybe it doesn't, but this, it's definitely one of the characteristics of uh, both these cables actually, is they're, they're, they're flexible enough to work with, they're not hard to move, but they will tend to stay where you put them. Next up is Redco Audio. Uh, these two model numbers on their cable is the um, TGS-HD and the TGS-MD. And this is just a slightly, the, um, the MD is just a slightly thinner version of the HD. Next up is the Redco TGS-HD and TGS-MD. Uh, I, I pulled these into the, the roundup here because I get a lot of stuff from Redco and if you need a one-stop shop for all your cable and pedal board kind of stuff, they sell tons of cables, connectors and everything and most of the cables that I got here, I got through Redco. Uh, no affiliation or anything like that, I just think they're, they're a good resource. They have re reasonable shipping, tra uh, shipping charges, I get my stuff on time, good website, uh, all that kind of stuff, I like them. So uh, the thing about these is these are definitely on the cheap side, so if you need to save a little bit of money, these look like good options. They have pretty good specifications, but overall um, they're, they're pretty flexible cables. This one has a slightly nicer finish or feel to it than this one does, uh, meaning the HD feels and looks just a little bit better than the MD. This actually has that kind of really rough outer jack on it, like if you would get those um, a built-in stereo cable where you would split them together and you would get that little uh, bit of extra material where the two cables broke apart. That's kind of what this feels like. So it's not the greatest feeling cable for an instrument cable or something like that, but it could work out really well for you on your pedal board. Next is the Gotham GAC-1. 
Now, I wanted to get the GAC-1 Ultra Pro, but the vendor was just out of stock on it at the time and I didn't want to wait, so I just got the GAC-1. Think about Gotham, they've been making cables a really long time, and if you go to their website, they have a pretty good catalog, they have lots of specifications to let you know exactly what you're gonna get. Um, it's, it's a really good price performance ratio on this cable. I don't see too many guys talk about them, but I've used these cables before in the past, and I've never really had any problems with them. They're easy to work with, it's easy to get, it's affordable. Um, it's a good option, I think, for both instrument cables and pedal board applications. Next, Canary. GS6 is the large one, GS4 is the small one. Canary has a great reputation. I think it's well-deserved. I've used these cables in the past, never had a problem with them. Great price to performance ratio for these. Uh, the GS6 is a great instrument cable. You even use these on your pedal boards. Uh, GS4, if you wanted something just a little bit smaller, this is a great patch cable to link all your pedals together. Uh, and this, I mean, I would use this stuff in a studio environment too if I didn't want the big, uh, the jacket on the, the GS6. GS4, I would use for a lot of things. I would use these for like power speaker hookups or you know patch bay lines or any of that kind of stuff. It's, it's just a really good, all around, well-performing cable. Last but certainly not least, Mogami. 2319 here on the left, the slightly smaller one, and the 2524 on the right. Uh, again, Mogami is just one of those brands. They've been around forever. They're really associated with hi-fi. I mean, I've installed major large format consoles using Mogami cable. Um, in the pro world, tons of guys just automatically default to it. Uh, but that's not to say that it's out of reach for you. I think if you get in some of their multi-pair cables, maybe it is a little bit overpriced. But if you look at the price per foot of both of these cables, I think it's very reasonable. Uh, great specs on these, great feeling, just all around. Everything's kind of where you need them between the flexibility and the durability. If you were to go with like 25, 24 for your instrument cables and then 23, 19 for everything else, that'd be perfectly fine. And you could pretty much wire up everything you had with just these two cables. So again, great price performance ratio on these. Uh, lots of history, lots of reputation, really good choice. Here's the overview on all the cables we just looked at. Now, unlike the quarter inch plug video where I did some sorting and we looked at it in three or four different ways, I've just sorted this by price and that's the only one that I really think is kind of relevant here because I think pretty much across the board you get what you pay for when it comes to cable. Unlike the quarter inch plugs, I think there's a little bit of distance where maybe some things were definitely um, overpriced a little bit and maybe the price didn't really reflect the quality. I think you, it scales pretty well with cable and I think the more you pay, you're gonna get better results. Which is not to say you need to go immediately to the top of the range here and just get the most expensive stuff you can. Because as you can see here, like yeah, I spoke very highly of the Canary and the Mogami cables, and those pretty much fall like you know fairly low on the on the spectrum. In the grand scheme of things, like this stuff is just really not that expensive. Even if you wanted to just replace all your generic cables with some of this brand name cable, I mean, if you think about how many feet you really need, it's really not that big of an investment, particularly if you're doing it yourself. Now, I know Mogami in particular, they sell their cables pre-assembled in some music stores. Not all of these companies do. Um, and like, I don't think I've ever seen a Canary cable uh, pre-made. Uh, Redco Audio certainly does, and you can get all kinds of stuff uh, built to your specification on the website. But again, if you're doing it yourself, I mean, just think of how much you would need to price this stuff out. Uh, I did not include price breaks on this because you really have to usually get up into maybe like 250, 350 feet. And I think even if you're gonna do quite a bit, you may not hit that much. And even then the price difference was, it was maybe like 3% on average. So, I mean, if, if you need that much and you're gonna save a couple cents and that's great, but it's not anything that's like, like the quarter inch plugs where oh, I'll just get a couple extra because then it saves me like a quarter per plug or something like that. You're just not gonna get that kind of a discount on the cable unless you get into thousands and thousands of feet of it. So, just have a look at the data, uh, think about how much you wanna spend, think about what you need and go from there. So as you look at all these cables, um, one thing I didn't talk about too much with the exception of these two lavas just because I had them is the soldered versus solderless if you want to make your own cables. Um, the reason I don't talk about it is because that's not really what I do. I mean, I make soldered cables for a living, so that's just kind of where, where my head is at. Um, if, if you want to go solderless, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it just because I'm looking at pretty much only solder cables here. There's tons of solder stuff out there, tons of people that use it and tons of people that don't have any problems with it. And not only that, there's tons of other brands I just didn't get to here in this particular roundup just because I didn't want to spend a million dollars buying every cable out there. But I mean, there's there's tons, if you look at like Sommer Cable or Evidence Audio has great kits, uh, Disaster Area Amps has their own solder plug. I mean, there's, there's really almost too many to mention. Um, I will definitely put some links to some other vendors for cables down in the description 
description. And by all means, what I just want to do here is give you some things to think about, put a few things in front of you, either brands or different uh, cables for different applications, just so you can think about what you really want. And chances are, uh, you've never really thought about cables that much before in the first place and just kind of used what was around or whatever was on sale at the music store or whatever. But cables, it's one of those things, it's, it's not very sexy to invest in, but good cabling just prevents problems. It prevents unwanted tone artifacts. Uh, it just gives you good connections, good signal flow, and it just lets you concentrate on other areas of your tone. If you buy good cable and you take care of it, it will last you for years and years. I, I have cables over there in my cable bin that I've had for almost 20 years. I'm still using. Uh, they still hold up fine and they're still working for me. So if you haven't se seriously uh, thought about making some cable investment or getting some fresh cable, either in your, your performance rig or your studio, maybe uh, you can take some of the information here from this video and start thinking about it and see if that's an area of uh, your rig that you need to improve. Anyway, uh, like I said, plenty of links in the description. I'll link to all this stuff plus some things I didn't talk about. Hope this has been informative for you and I'll see you next time.